different tonight. No game tonight. Um, by request from Tito, I am going to read a little bit of prose and poetry from some of my favorite classic fiction authors. Um, if you have any requests, um, I might be able to dig something up and read it cold, but I'm going to start with the fiction of Robert E. Howard, famous for Conan, among others. Um, going to start with a short little poem called Samaria. Samaria, a poem. It was gloomy land that seemed to hold all winds and clouds and dreams that shun the sun, with bare boughs rattling in the lonesome winds, and the dark woodlands brooding over all. Not even lightened by the rare dim sun, which made squat shadows out of men, they called it Samaria, land of darkness a deep night. It was so long ago and far away, I have forgotten the very name men called me the axe and flint-tipped spear are like a dream, and hunts and wars are like shadows. I recall only the stillness of that somber land, the clouds that piled forever on the hills, the dimness of the everlasting woods, Samaria, land of darkness, and the night. The next story I would like to read for you is a short story. Um, that has been published by Robert E. Howard under several different titles, Gods of the North, The Frost Giant's Daughter, and The Frost King's Daughter. Um, this is a bit of a lengthy one, but I think you'll enjoy it. The clangor of the swords had died away. The shouting of the slaughter was hushed. Silence lay on the red-stained snow. The pale, bleak sun that glittered so blindingly from the ice fields and the snow-covered plains struck sheens of silver from rent corslet and broken blade where the dead lay in heaps. The nerveless hand yet gripped the broken hilt, helmeted heads, back drawn in the death throes, tilted red beards and golden beards grimly upwards, as if in last invocation to Ymir, the frost giant. Across the red drifts and mail-clad forms, two figures approached one another. In that utter desolation, only they moved. The frosty sky was over them, the white, illimitable plain around them, the dead men at their feet. Slowly through the corpses they came, as ghosts might come to a tryst through the shambles of a world. Their shields were gone, their corslets dinted. Blood smeared their mail, their swords were red. Their horned helmets showed the marks of fierce strokes. One spoke, he whose locks and beard were red as the blood on the sunlit snow. Man of the raven locks, said he, tell me your name so that my brothers in Vanaheim may know who was the last of Wolfhir's band to fall before the sword of Heimdall. This is my answer, replied the black-haired warrior. Not in Vanaheim, but in Valhalla will you tell your brothers the name of Amra of Akpatana. Heimdall roared and sprang, and his sword swung in a mighty arc. Amra staggered, and his vision was filled with red sparks as the blade shivered into bits of blue fire on his helmet. But as he reeled, he thrust with all the power of his great shoulders. The sharp point drove through brass scales and bones and heart, and the red-haired warrior died at Amra's feet. Amra stood swaying, trailing his sword, a sudden sick weariness assailing him. The glare of the sun on the snow cut his eyes like a knife, and the sky seemed shrunken and strangely far. He turned away from the trampled expanse, where yellow-bearded warriors lay locked with red-haired slayers in the embrace of death. A few steps he took, and the glare of the snowfields was suddenly dimmed. A rushing wave of blindness engulfed him, and he sank down into the snow, supporting himself on one mailed arm, seeking to shake the blindness out of his eyes, as a lion might shake his mane. A silvery laugh cut through his Disney dizziness, and his sight cleared slowly. There was a strangeness about all the landscape that he could not place or define, an unfamiliar tinge to earth and sky. 
But he did not think long of this. Before him, swaying like a sapling in the wind, stood a woman. Her body was like ivory, and save for a veil of gossamer, she was naked as the day. Her slender bare feet were whiter than the snow they spurned. She laughed, and her laughter was sweeter than the rippling of silvery fountains, and poisonous with cruel mockery. Who are you? demanded the warrior. What matter? Her voice was more musical than a silver stringed harp, but it was edged with cruelty. Call up your men, he growled, grasping his sword. Though my strength fail me, yet they shall not take me alive. I see that you are of the Vanner. Have I said so? He looked again at her unruly locks, which he had thought to be red. Now he saw that they were neither red nor yellow, but a glorious compound of both colors. He gazed spellbound. Her hair was like elfin gold, striking which the sun dazzled him. Her eyes were neither wholly blue nor wholly gray, but of shifting colors and dancing lights and clouds of color he could not recognize. Her full red lips smiled, and from, from her slim feet to the blinding crown of her billowy hair, her ivory body was as perfect as the dream of a god. Amra's pulse hammered in his temples. I cannot tell, he said, whether you are of Vanaheim and mine enemy, or of Asgard and my friend. Far have I wandered from Zingara to the Sea of Vilayet, in Stygia and Cush, and the country of the Hyrcanians. But a woman like you I have never seen. Your locks blind me with their brightness. Not even among the fairest daughters of the Aesir have I seen such hair by Ymir. Who are you to swear by Ymir? she mocked. What know you of the gods of ice and snow, you who have come up from the south to adventure among strangers? By the dark gods of my own race, he cried in anger, have I been backward in the sword play, stranger or no? This day I have seen four score warriors fall, and I alone survive the field where Mulfir's reavers met the men of Bragi. Tell me, woman, have you caught the flash of mail across the snow plains, or seen armed men moving upon the ice? I have seen the hoarfrost glittering in the sun, she answered. I have heard the wind whispering across the everlasting snows. He shook his head. Nyord, I should have come up with us before the battle joined. I fear he and his warriors have been ambushed. Wolf here lies dead with all his weapon men. I had thought there was no village within many leagues of this spot, for the war carried us far. But you can have come no great distance over these snows, naked as you are. Lead me to your pride, tribe, if you are of Asgard, for I am faint with the weariness of strife. My dwelling place is further than you can walk, Amra of Akpatana, she laughed. Spreading wide her arms, she swayed before him, her golden head lolling wantonly, her scintillant eyes shattered beneath long silken lashes. Am I not beautiful, man? Like dawn running naked on the snows, he muttered, his eyes burning like those of a wolf. Then why do you not rise and follow me? Who is the strong warrior who falls down before me? She chanted in maddening mockery. Lie down and die in the snow with the other fools, Amra of the black hair. You cannot follow where I would lead. With an oath, the man heaved himself upon his feet, his blue eyes blazing, his dark, scarred face convulsed. Rage shook his soul, but the desire for the taunting figure before him hammered at his temples and drove his wild blood riotously through his veins. Passion, fierce as physical ag agony, flooded his whole being so that the earth and sky swam red to his dizzy gaze, and weariness and faintness were swept from him in madness. He spoke no word as he drove at her fingers hooked like talons. With a shriek of laughter she leaped back and ran, laughing at him over her white shoulder. With a low growl Amra followed. He had forgotten the fight, forgotten the mailed warriors who lay in their blood, forgotten the yards belated reavers. He had thought only for the slender white shape which seems to float rather than run before him. Out across a white blinding plain she led him. The trampled red field fell out of sight behind him, 
but still Amra kept on with the silent tenacity of his race. His mailed feet broed through the frozen crusts. He sank deep in the drifts and forged through them by sheer strength. But the girl danced across the snow as light as a feather floating across a pool. Her naked feet scarcely left their imprint on the hoarfrost. In spite of the fire in his veins, the cold bit through the warrior's mail and furs, but the girl in her gossamer veil ran as lightly and as gaily as if she had danced through the palms and rose gardens of Poitain. Black curses drooled through the warrior's parched lips. The great veins swelled and throbbed in his temples, and his teeth gnashed spasmodically. "'You cannot escape me!' he roared. "'Lead me into a trap, and I'll pile the heads of your kinsmen at your feet. Hide from me, and I'll tear apart the mountains to find you. I'll follow you to hell and beyond hell.' Her maddening laughter floated back to him, and foam flew from the warrior's lips. Further and further into the waste she led him, till he saw the wide plains give way to low hills, marching upward in broken ranges. Far to the north he caught a glimpse of towering mountains, blue with the distance, or white with the eternal snows. Above these mountains shone the flaring rays of the Borealis. They sprang fanwise into the sky, frosty blades of cold flaming light, changing in color, growing and brightening. Above him the skies glowed and cracked with strange lights and gleams. The snow shone weirdly, now frosty blue, now icy crimson, now cold silver. Through a shimmering icy realm of enchantment, Amra plunged doggedly onward, in a crystalline maze where the only reality was the white body dancing across the glittering snow beyond his reach, ever beyond his reach. Yet he did not wonder at the necromantic strangeness of it all, not even when two gigantic fissures rose up to bar his way. The scales of their mail were white with hoarfrost, their helmets and their axes were sheathed in ice. Snow sprinkled their locks, in their beards were spikes of icicles, their eyes were cold as the lights that streamed above them. Brothers, cried the girl, dancing between them, look who follows. I have brought you a man for the feasting. Take his heart that we may lay it smoking on our father's board. The giants answered with roars like the grinding of icebergs on a frozen shore, and heaved upon their shining axes as the maddening Akbatanian hurled himself upon them. A frosty blade flashed before his eyes, blinding him with its brightness and he gave back a terrible stroke that sheared through his foe's thigh. With a groan, the victim fell, and at the instant Amra was dashed into the snow, his left shoulder numb from the blow of the survivor, from which the warrior's mail had barely saved his life. Amra saw the remaining giant looming above him like a colossus of carved ice, etched against the glowing sky. The axe fell to sink through the snow and deep into the frozen earth, as Amra hurled himself aside and leaped to his feet. The giant roared and wrenched the axe head free, but even as he did so, Amra's sword sang down. The giant's knees bent, and he sank slowly into the snow which turned crimson, with the blood that gushed from his half-severed neck. Amra wheeled to see the girl standing a short distance away, staring in wide-eyed horror, all mockery gone from her face. He cried out fiercely, and the blood drops flew from his sword as his hand shook in the intensity of his passion. "'Call the rest of your brothers,' he roared. "'Call the dogs. I'll give their hearts to the wolves.' With a cry of fright, she turned and fled. She did not laugh now, nor mock him over her shoulder. She ran as for her life, and though he strained every nerve and thew, until his temples were like to burst and the snow swam red to his gaze, she drew away from him dwindling in the witch-fires of the sky, until she was a figure no bigger than a child, than a dancing white flame on the snow, than a dim blur in the distance. But grinding his teeth until the blood started from his gums, he reeled on, and he saw the blur grow to a dancing white flame, and then she was running less than a hundred paces ahead of him, and slowly the space narrowed, foot by foot. She was running with effort now, her golden locks blowing free. He heard the quick panting of her breath and saw a flash of fear in the look she cast over her alabaster shoulder. The grim endurance of the warrior had served him well. The speed ebbed from her flashing white legs. She reeled in her gait. 
In his untamed soul flamed up the fires of hell she had fanned so well. With an inhuman roar he closed in on her, just as she wheeled with haunting cry and flung out her arms to fend him off. His sword fell into the snow as he crushed her to him. Her supple body bent backwards as she fought with desperate frenzy in his iron arms. Her golden hair blew about his face, blinding him with its sheen. The feel of her slender figure twisting in his mailed arms drove him to blind her madness. His strong fingers sank deep into her smooth flesh, and that flesh was cold as ice. It was as if he embraced not a woman of human flesh and blood, but a woman of flaming ice. She writhed her golden head aside, striving to avoid the savage kisses that bruised her red lips. "'You are cold as the snow,' he mumbled dazedly. "'I will warm you with the fire in my own blood.' With a desperate wrench she twisted from his arms, leaving her single gossamer garment in his grasp. She sprang back and faced him, her golden locks in wild disarray, her white bosom heaving her beautiful eyes blazing with terror. For an instant he stood frozen, awed by her terrible beauty as she posed naked against the snows. And in that instance she flung her arms towards the lights that glowed in the sky above her and cried out in a voice that rang in Amra's ears forever after, Emir, O oh my father, save me. Amra was leaping forward, arms spread to seize her, when with a crack like the breaking of an ice mountain, the whole skies leaped into icy fire. The girl's ivory body was suddenly enveloped in a cold blue flame so blinding that the warrior threw up his hands to shield his eyes. A fleeting instant, skies and snowy hills were bathed in crackling white flames, blue darts of icy light and frozen crimson fires. Then Amra staggered and cried out, the girl was gone. The glowing snow lay empty and bare. High above him the witch lights flared and played in a frosty sky gone mad, and among the distant blue mountains there sounded a rolling of thunder, as of gigantic war chariots rushing behind steeds whose frantic hooves struck the lightning from the snows and echoes from the sky. Then suddenly the borealis, the snowy hills, and the blazing heavens reeled drunkenly into Amra's sight. Thousands of fireballs burst with showers of sparks, and the sky itself became a titanic wheel which rained stars as it spun. Under his feet the snowy hills heaved up like a wave, and the Akbatanan crumpled to the snows to lie motionless. Alright, I'm going to take a break for just a moment and see what's going on on the track in the chat, and then we will continue with the next part. Drew Mega, thank you for the subscription, brother. Um, and welcome to the Ship of Fools. Um, thank you, Papa Bear, for the host. And let me... You can follow both of these gentlemen in the link on my stream. Um, both very entertaining. Um, both members of the Red Planet. Um, but give me a moment to wet my throat. And we will continue. In a cold, dark universe whose sun was extinguished eons ago, Amra felt the movement of life, alien and unguessed. An earthquake had him in its grip and was shaking him to and fro, at the same time chafing his hands and feet until he yelled in pain and fury and groped for his sword. Is coming too, Horsa, grunted a voice. Haste, we must rub the frost out of his limbs, if he's ever to wield sword again. He won't open his left hand, growled another, his voice indicating muscular strain. He's clutching something. Amra opened his eyes and stared into the bearded faces that bent over him. He was surrounded by tall, golden-haired warriors in mail and furs. Amra, you live! By Krom, Njord, grasped he. Am I alive, or are we all dead and in Valhalla? We live, grunted the Aesir, busy over Amra's half-frozen feet. We had to fight our way through an ambush, else we had come up with you before the battle was joined. The corpses were scarce cold when we came upon the field. We did not find you among the dead, so we followed your spore. In Ymir's name, Amra, why did you wander off into the wastes of the north? We have followed your tracks in the snow for hours. Had a blizzard come up and hidden them, 
We had never found you by Emir. Swear not so often by Emir, muttered a warrior, glancing at the distant mountains. This is his land, and the god bides among yonder mountains, the legends say. I followed a woman, Amra answered hazily. We met Bragi's men in the plains. I know not how long we fought. I alone lived. I was dizzy and faint. The land lay like a dream before me. Only now do all things seem natural and familiar. The woman came and taunted me. She was beautiful as a frozen flame from hell. When I looked at her, I was as one mad and forgot all else in the world. I followed her. Did you not find her tracks? Or the giants in the icy mail I slew? Nayord shook his head. We found only your tracks in the snow, Amra. Then it may be I was mad, sat Amra dazedly. Yet you yourself are no more real to me than was the golden-haired witch who fled naked across the snows before me. Yet from my very hand she vanished in an icy flame. He is delirious, whispered a warrior. Not so, cried an older man whose eyes were wild and weird. It was Atali, the daughter of Ymir, the frost giant. To fields of the dead she comes and shows herself to the dying. Myself, when, I, when a boy, I saw her when I lay half slain on the bloody field of Walraven. I saw her walk among the dead in the snows, her naked body gleaming like ivory and her golden hair like a blinding flame in the moonlight. I lay and howled like a dying dog because I could not crawl after her. She lures men from the stricken fields into the wasteland to be slain by her brothers, the ice giants, who lay men's red hearts smoking on Ymir's board. Amra has seen a tali, the Frost Giant's daughter. Bah! grunted Horsa. Old Gorm's mind was turned in his youth by a sword cut on the head. Amro was delirious with the fury of battle. Look how his helm is dinted. Any of those blows might have addled his brain. It was an hallucination he followed into the waste. He is from the south. What does he know of a tally? You speak truth, perhaps, muttered Amra. It was all strange and weird by Krom. He broke off, glaring at the object that still dangled from his clenched left fist. The others gaped silently at the veil he held up, a wisp of gossamer that was never spun by human distaff. I hope you enjoyed that one. It's one of my favorite shorter Conan stories. That was as it was originally presented before it was rewritten as a story of Conan of Samaria. Um, the next piece, let's see what I have up here. Um, next on the list is a selection of poetry by Edgar Allan Poe. I've got a few pieces that I think you guys might like. Let me switch my library over to the poetical works of Edgar Allan Poe. Let's see what I have bookmarked. Hmm. Let's start with a couple of short ones. This one is one of my favorites. Um, it was um, one of many that was set to music by the Alan Parsons Project on their album Tales of Mystery and Imagination, of which every song on that album is based on a poem or a story by Edgar Allan Poe. If you're a fan of progressive music and if you're a fan of Edgar Allan Poe, I highly recommend Tales of Mystery and Imagination by the Alan Parsons Project. Now, on with the poetry. Start with a short one. This one is A Dream Within a Dream. Take this kiss upon the brow and in parting from you now, this much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream. Yet if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep. O oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? 
O God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? The next one I'd like to read for you is El Dorado. Gaily bedight, a gallant knight, in his sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long singing a song in search of El Dorado. But he grew old this night so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow, fell as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? O'er the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. Now, a little bit lengthy, this next one. This is called the Colosseum, and it's not so much a poem and that it's not the traditional rhyming verse, but it is very poetic, and perhaps you will like it as I like it. The Colosseum by Edgar Allan Poe. Type of the antique Rome, rich reliquary of lofty contemplation left to time by buried centuries of pomp and power. At length, at length, after so many days of weary pilgrimage and burning thirst, thirst for the springs of lore that in thee lie, I kneel, an altered and humbled man, amid thy shadows, and so drink within my very soul thy grandeur, gloom, and glory. Vastness and age and memories of eld, silence and desolation and dim night. I feel ye now, I feel ye in your strength, O oh, spells more sure than ever a Judean king taught in the gardens of Gethsemane. O oh, charms more potent than the rapt Chaldee ever drew down from out the quiet stars. Here, where a hero fell, a column falls. Here, where the mimic eagle glared in gold, a midnight vigil holds the swarthy bat. Here, where the dames of Rome, their gilded hair waved to the wind, now wave the reed and thistle. Here, where on golden throne the monarch lolled, glides specter-like unto his marbled home. Lit by the wan light of the horned moon, the swift and silent lizard of the stones. But stay, these walls, these ivy-clad arcades, these moldering plinths, these sad and blackened shafts, these vague entablatures, this crumbling frieze, these shattered cornices, this wreck, this ruin, these stones, alas, these gray stones, are they all? All of the famed and the colossal left by the corrosive hours to fate and me? Not all, the echoes answer me. Not all. Prophetic sounds and loud arise forever from us, and from all ruin unto the wise, as melody from Memnon to the sun. We rule the hearts of mightiest men. We rule with a despotic sway all giant minds. We are not impotent, we pallid stones. Not all our power is gone, not all our fame, not all the magic of our high renown, not all the wonder that encircles us, not all the mysteries that in us lie, not all the memories that hang upon and cling around about us as a garment, clothing us in a robe of more than glory. All right. Now... The next one is my favorite among the poems of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, this one is The Bells. Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells. What a world of merriment the melody foretells. How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in their icy air of night. While the stars that oversprinkle, all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight. Keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the tintinabulation that so musically wells, from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells, what a world of happiness the harmony foretells. 
through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight from the molten golden notes, and all in tune, what a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells, how it swells, how it dwells on the future, how it tells of the rapture that impels to the swinging and the ring of the bells, 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 of the bells, 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Hear the loud alarum bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror now their turbulency tells. In the startled ear of night, how they scream out their affright. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek, out of tune. In a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with the death and frantic fire, leaping higher, higher, higher with a desperate desire and a resolute endeavor. Now, now to sit or never, by the side of a pale-faced moon. Of the bells, 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 what a tale of terror tells, of despair. How they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they outpour, on the bosom of the palpitating air. Yet the ear it fully knows, by the twanging and the clanging, how the danger ebbs and flows. Yet the ear distinctly tells, in the jangling and the wrangling, how the danger sinks and swells by the sinking of the swelling in the anger of the bells, of the bells, of the bells, 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 in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells, what a world of solemn thought their monody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone, for every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan. And the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple, all alone, and who toiling, toiling, toiling in that muffled monotone, feel a glory in so rolling on the human heart a stone. They are neither man nor woman. They are neither brute nor human. They are ghouls, and their king it is who tolls, as he rolls, 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 rolls a paean from the bells, and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells, and he dances and he yells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the paean of the bells, of the bells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in a happy runic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. All right, let me have a look at what else is on my list. Perhaps we'll do a couple of more poetry pieces let's see we've done that we've done that the last one i will do for this segment is the haunted palace in the greenest of our valleys by good angels tenanted tenanted once a fair and stately place radiant palace reared its head in the monarch thought's dominion it stood there Never seraph spread opinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious, golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts plumed and pallid, a winged odor went away. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous windows saw, Spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law, bound about a throne where sitting, Porphyrogene, in his state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen, and all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing, in the voices of her passing beauty, the wit and wisdom of their king. But evil things in robes of sorrow, 
assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim-remembered story of old time entombed. And travelers now within that valley, through the red-litten windows see, vast forms that move fantastically to the discordant melody, while like a ghastly rapid river, through the pale door a hideous throng rush out forever, and laugh, but smile no more. All right, give me a moment. Next, I'd like to read from you one of my favorite books, a book that was given to me as a gift by my beloved, from which I read to her every night when we were younger. That book is Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, an interesting book in that it is written in the guise of journal entries and newspaper clippings and is all secondhand anecdotes and collections of information that come together to tell a story. Um, this piece here um, is chapter seven, a cutting from the Daily Graph, 8 August, painted in Mina Murray's journal. From a correspondent, Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as was ever known, and the great body of holidaymakers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robins Hood Bay, Rig Mill, Runswick Stays, and the various trips in the neighborhood of Whitby. The steamers Emma and Scarborough made trips up and down the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff Churchyard, and from the commanding eminence watched the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east, called attention to a sudden show of mare's tails high in the sky to the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest. In the mild degree, which barometrical languages ranked number two light breeze. The Coast Guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman, who for more than half a century has kept watch on the weather signs from the East Cliff, foretold in an emphatic manner of the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly colored clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff of the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by a myriad of clouds of every sunset color, flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses, not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness, in all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm will grace the R.A. and R.I. walls in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble, or his mule as they term the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbor till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea, for even the coasting steamers which usually hugged the shore so closely kept well to seaward, and but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sails set which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment while she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in the face of her danger. Before the night shut down, she was seen with a sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea. As idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. 
Shortly before ten o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleeding of a sheep inland, or the barking of a dog in the town, was distinctly heard, and the band on the pier, with its lively French air, was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke, with a rapidity which, at the time, seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realize, the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopped by its fellow till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White-crested waves beat madly on the level sands and rushed up the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spume swept the lanthorns of the lighthouse which rise from the end of the pier of Whitby Harbor. The wind roared like thunder and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet or clung with grim clasp to the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire pier from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet clouds which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold that it needed but little effort of a man <clears throat> little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their li living brethren with the clammy hands of death, and many a one shuddered as the wreath of sea mist swept by. At times the mist cleared, and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which came thick and fast, followed by such peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and absorbing interest. The sea, running mountains high through skywards with each wave, each wave mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing boat, with a rag of sail, running madly for shelter before the blast. Now and again the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east cliff, the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it into working order, and in the pauses of onrushing mist swept it with the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, as when a fishing boat, with gunwale under water, rushed into the harbor, able by the guidance of the sheltering light, to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. As each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on the shore, a shout which for a short moment seemed to cleave the gale, and then was swept away into the rush. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sails set, apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time back to the east and there was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff as they realized the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered, and with the wind blowing from its present quarter, it would be quite impossible that she should fetch the entrance of the harbor. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that in their troughs the shallows of the shore were almost visible, and the schooner, with all sails set, was rushing with such speed that, in the words of one old salt, she must fetch up somewhere if it was only in hell. Then came another rush of sea fog, greater than any hitherto, and a mass of dank mist which seemed to close on all things like a gray pall, and left available to men only the organ of hearing. For the roar of the tempest, and the crash of the thunder, and the booming of the mighty billows came through the damp oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed upon the harbor mouth across the east pier, where the shock was expected, and men waited breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast, and the remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast, and then, Mirabal Dictu, between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast, with all sails set, and gained the safety of the harbor. 
The searchlight followed her, and the shudder ran through all who saw her. For last to the helm was a corpse with drooping head, which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on the deck at all. A great awe came upon all as they realized that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbor, unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbor, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel washed by many tides and many storms into the southeast corner of the pier jetting under the east cliff, known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove upon the sand heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But, strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang upon the deck from below as if shot up by the concussion, and running forward, jumped from the bow on the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to the east pier, so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, thruff stones, or through stones as they call it, them in the Whitby vernacular, actually project over the where the sustaining cliff had fallen away. It disappeared in the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as all those whose houses are in close proximity were either in bed or out on the heights above. Thus the Coast Guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbor, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb aboard. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance of the harbor without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The Coast Guard ran aft, and when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it and recoiled at once as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It is a good way round from West Cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier, but your correspondent is a fairly good runner and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd, from whom the Coast Guard and police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck, and was one of a small group who saw the dead seamen whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised, or even awed, for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel, and all kept fast by the binding cord. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel and had dragged him to and fro, so that the cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, Surgeon J. M. Caffin of 33 East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared after making an examination that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked and empty save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have tied up his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was the first on board may save some complications later on in the Admiralty Court, for Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues are wagging, and one young law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statutes of Mortmain, since the tiller, as emblemship, if not proof, of delegated possession is held in a dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman has been reverently removed from the place where he held his honorable watch and ward till death. A steadfastness as noble as that of young Casabianca and placed in the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing and its fierceness is abating. Crowds are scattering backwards, and the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire wolds. 
I shall send, in time for your next issue, further details of their derelict ship which found her way so miraculously into harbor in the storm. 9. August The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is Russian, from Varna, and is called the Demeter. She is almost entirely in ballast of silver stand, with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mold. This cargo was consigned to Whitby, to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington of Seven, the Crescent, who this morning went aboard and took formal possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship and paid all harbor dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with the existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days wonder, they are evidently determined that there shall be no cause of other complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck, and more than a few members of the SPCA, which is strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way onto the moors, where it's still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later on it should in itself become a danger, for it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning a large dog, a half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant close to Tate Hill Pier, was found dead in the roadway off its, opposite its master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away, and its belly was slit open as if with a savage claw. Later, by the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as facts to missing men. The greatest interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest, and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold than let me try that again. And a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold it has not been my lot to come across. As there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them and accordingly send you a transcript simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he had got well into blue water and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me, time being short. Log of the Den Demeter, Varna to Whitby Written 18 July, things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth till we land. On 6 July, we finish taking in cargo, silver sand and boxes of earth at noon set sail east wind fresh crew five hands two mates cook and myself captain on 11 july at dawn entered bosphorus boarded by turkish customs officials bakshish all correct underway at 4 p.m on 12 through july through the dardanelles more customs officers and a flag boat of guarding squadron. Bakshish again. Work of officers thorough but quick. Want us off soon. A dark passed into archipelago. On 13 July passed Cape Matapan. Crew dissatisfied about something. Seemed scared but would not speak out. On 14 July was somewhat anxious about crew. Men, all steady fellows who sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day and struck him. Expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16 July, Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. 
took larboard watch eight bells last night, was relieved by Amramoff, but did not go to bunk. Men more downcast than ever. All said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than there was something aboard. Mate, getting very impatient with them, feared some trouble ahead. On 17 July yesterday, one of the men, Olgarin, came to my cabin, and in an awestruck way, confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deck house as there was a rainstorm when he saw a tall, thin man, who was not like any of the crew, come up the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to bows, found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I am afraid the panic may spread. To allay it, I shall today search the entire ship from stem to stern. Later in that day, I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship, we would search from stem to stern. First mate, angry, said it was folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men, said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with the hand spike. I let him take the helm, while the rest began a thorough search, all keeping abreast with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched, as there were no as there were only the big wooden boxes, there were no odd corners where a man could hide. Men were much relieved when the search over, and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 22 July. Rough weather last three days, and all hands busy with sails, no time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Mate cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praised men for work in bad weather past Gibraltar and out through the straits. All well. 24 July. There seems some doom over this ship. Already a hand short, and entering the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead, and yet last night another man lost, disappeared. Like the first, he came off of his watch and was not seen again. Men, all in a panic of fear, sent around Robin asking to have double watch, as they fear to be alone. Mate, angry. Fear there will be some trouble, as either he or men will do some violence. 28 July. Four days in hell, knocking about in a sort of maelstrom, yes. the wind a tempest. No sleep for anyone. Men all worn out. Hardly know how to set a watch, since no one fit to go on. Second mate volunteered to steer and watch and let men snatch a few hours sleep. Wind abating, seas still terrific, but feel them less as ship is steadier. 29 July. Another tragedy. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, no. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersman. Raised an outcry and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without second mate and crew in a panic. Mate and I agree to go armed henceforth and wait for any sign of cause. 30 July, last night. Rejoiced we are nearing England. Weather fine, all sails set. Retired, worn out, slept soundly. Awakened by mate telling me that both man of watch and steersman missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work ship. 1 August. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. Had hoped when in the English Channel to be able to signal for help or get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails, have to run before wind. Dare not lower as could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of the men. His stronger nature seemed to have worked in inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear, working stolidly and patiently with minds made up to worst. They are Russian, he Romanian. 2 August, midnight. Woke up from few minutes sleep by hearing a cry seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in fog. Rushed on deck and ran against a mate. Tells me he heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. One more gone, Lord help us. Mate says we must be past Straits of Dover. 
As in a moment of fog lifting, he saw North Foreland, just as he heard the man cry out. If so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in the fog, which seems to move with us, and God seems to have deserted us. 3 August. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it, found no one there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before it, there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. After a few seconds, he rushed up on deck in his finals. He looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely with his mouth to my ear as though fearing the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night I saw it like a man tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows and looking out. I crept behind it and gave it my knife, but the knife went through it, empty as the air. And as he spoke, he took the knife and drove it savagely into space. Then he went on, But it is here, and I'll find it. It is in the hold, perhaps in one of those boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You're, you work the helm. And with a warning look and his finger on his lip, he went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and lantern, and go down the forward hatchway. He is mad, stark raving mad, and it's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They are invoiced as clay, and to pull them about is as harmless a thing as he can do. So here I stay and mind the helm, and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait till the fog clears. Then if I can't steer to any harbor with the wind that is, I shall cut down the sails and lie by and signal for help. It is nearly all over now, just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him. There came up the hatchway a sudden startled scream which made my blood run cold, and up on the deck he came as if shot from a gun, a raging madman, with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. Save me, save me, he cried, and look, then looked round on the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You had better come too, Captain, before it is too late. He is there. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him, and it is all that is left. Before I could say a, woo, a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one, and now he has followed them himself. God help me, how am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port, when will that ever be? CFG Games, welcome to the stream. Um, reading a few passages from Dracula. I'm going to jump right back in. 4 August. Still fog, which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is sunrise because I am a sailor. Why else I know not. I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed, and in the dimness of night I saw it. Him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a man. To die like a sailor in blue water, no man can object. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul, and my honor as a captain. I am growing weaker, and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhaps this bottle may be found, and those who find it may understand. If not, well, then all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the Saints help a poor ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course, the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce. And whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is now none to say. The folk here hold almost universally that the captain is simply a hero, and he is to be given a public funeral. 
Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken with a train of boats up the Esk for a piece and then brought back to the Tate Hill Pier and up the Abbey Steps, for he is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the great dog, at which there is much mourning, for, with public opinion in its present state, he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. Tomorrow we'll see the funeral, and so we'll end this one more mystery of the sea. Ah. Okay. Let me have a moment here. Let me um jump forward to chapter eight. At this point, um the vampire um Vlad Dracula is pursuing Lucy Westenra, the friend and confidant of Mina Murray, who is the wife of the protagonist Jonathan Harker in this story. Dracula pursues Lucy despite their efforts to the otherwise and they do not yet realize what they are dealing with. From the diary of Mina Murray 11 August. Diary again. No sleep now, so I may well write. I am too agitated to sleep. We have had such an adventure, such an agonizing experience. I fell asleep as soon as I had closed my diary. Suddenly I became broad awake and sat up, with a horrible sense of fear upon me, and of some feeling of emptiness around me. The room was dark, so I could not see Lucy's bed. I stole across and felt for her. The bed was empty. I lit a match and found that she was not in the room. The door was shut, but not locked as I had left it. I feared to wake her mother, who has been more than usually ill lately, so threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. As I was leaving the room, it struck me that the clothes she wore might give me some clue to her dreaming intention. Dressing gown would mean house, dress outside. Dressing gown and dress were both in their places. Thank God, I said to myself, she cannot be far as she is only in her nightdress. I ran downstairs and looked in the sitting room. Not there. Then I looked in all the other rooms of the house, with an ever-growing fear chilling my heart. Finally, I came to the hall door and found it open. It was not wide open, but the catch of the lock had not caught. The people of the house were careful, careful to lock the door every night, so I feared that Lucy must have gone out as she was. There was no time to think of what might happen. A vague, overmastering fear obscured all details. I took a big heavy shawl and ran out. The clock was striking one as I was in the crescent, and there was not a soul in sight. I ran along the north terrace, but could see no sign of the white figure which I expected. At the edge of the west cliff above the pier, I looked across the harbor to the east cliff in the hope or fear, I don't know which, of seeing Lucy in our favorite seat. There was a bright full moon with heavy black driving clouds which threw the whole scene into a fleeting diorama of light and shade as they sailed across. For a moment or two I could see nothing as the shadow of a cloud obscured St. Mary's Church and all around it. Then as the cloud passed I could see the ruins of the abbey coming into view, and as the edge of a narrow band of light, as sharp as a sword cut, moved along, the church and the churchyard became gradually visible. Whatever my expectation was, it was not disappointed, for there, on our favorite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. The coming of the cloud was too quick for me to see much, for a shadow shut down on light almost immediately, but it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone, and bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. I did not wait to catch another glance, but flew down the steep steps to the pier and along by the fish market to the bridge, which was the only way to reach the east cliff. The town seemed as dead, for not a soul did I see. I rejoiced that it was so, for I wanted no witness of poor Lucy's condition. 
The time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled and my breath came labored as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, and yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighted with lead, and as though every joint in my body were rusty. When I got almost to the top I could see the seat and the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it even through the spells of shadow. There was undoubtedly something long and black, bending over the half-reclining white figure. I called in fright, Lucy, Lucy, and something raised a head, and from where I was I could see a white face and red gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered, the church was between me and the seat, and for a minute or so I lost sight of her. When I came in view again, the cloud had passed, and the moonlit struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy half reclining with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone, and there was a, not a sign of any living thing about. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing, not softly as usual with her, but in long, heavy gasps, as though striving to get her lungs full at every breath. As I came close, she put up her hand in her sleep and pulled the collar of her nightdress close around her, as though she felt the cold. I flung the warm shawl over her and drew the edges tight around her neck, for I dreaded lest she should get some deadly chill from the night air, unclad as she was. I feared to wake her all at once, so in order to have my hands free to help her, I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety oh, pin. No. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety, and pinched or pricked her with it. For, by and by, when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again and moaned. Yeah. When I had her carefully wrapped up, I put my shoes on her feet, and they began gently to wake her. At first she did not respond, but gradually she became more and more uneasy in her sleep, moaning and sighing occasionally. At last, as time was passing fast, and for many other reasons, I wished to get her home at once, <coughs> I shook her forcibly till finally she opened her eyes and awoke. She did not seem surprised to see me as, of course, she did not realize all at once where she was. Mr. Laughon. Mr. Laffon, thank you for the host, sir. Lucy always wakes prettily, and even at such a time when her body must have been chilled with cold and her mind somewhat appalled at waking unclad in a churchyard at night, she did not lose her grace. She trembled a little and clung to me. When I told her to come at once with me home, she rose without a word, with the obedience of a child. As we passed along, the gravel hurt my feet, and Lucy noticed me wince. She stopped and wanted to assist upon my taking my shoes, but I would not. However, when we got to the pathway outside the churchyard, where there was a puddle of water remaining from the storm, I daubed my feet with mud, using each foot in turn on the other, so that as we went home, no one in case we should meet anyone else should notice my bare feet. Fortune favored us, and we got home without meeting a soul. Once we saw a man, who seemed not quite sober, passing along a street in front of us, but we hid in the door till he had disappeared up an opening such as there are here, steep little closes or wines, as they call them in Scotland. My heart beat so loud all the time, sometimes I thought I should faint. I was filled with anxiety about Lucy, not only for her health, lest she should suffer from the exposure, but for her reputation in case the story should get wind. When we got in and had washed our feet and had said a prayer of thankfulness together, I tucked her into bed. Before falling asleep, she asked, even implored me not to say a word to anyone, even her mother, about her sleepwalking adventure. I hesitated at first to promise, but on thinking of the state of her mother's health and how the knowledge of such a thing would fret her, and think, too, of how such a story might become distorted, nay, infallibly would, in case it should leak out, I thought it wiser to do so. I hope I did right. I have locked the door, and the key is tied to my wrist, so perhaps I shall not be disturbed again. Lucy is sleeping soundly. The reflex of dawn is high and far over the sea. All right, take a break for just a moment. 
to um give my voice a break so I don't go hoarse. Let's see. Next from chapter 13. This is after the mysterious death of Lucy from an illness as yet undefined and Lucy has been laid to rest. The Westminster Gazette entry 25 September a Hampstead mystery. The neighborhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as the Kensington Horror, or the Stabbing Woman, or the Woman in Black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves, but the consensus of their excuses is that they had been with a bluefer lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missed, and on two occasions the children have not been found until early in the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighborhood that, as the first child missed gave his reason for being away that a bluefer lady had asked him to come for a walk, the others had picked up the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural as the favorite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes us that to see some of the tiny tots pretending to be the bluefer lady is supremely funny. Some of our caricaturists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesque by comparing the reality and the picture. It is only in accordance with general principles of human nature that the blue for lady should be the popular role at these al fresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that Ellen Terry could not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced little children pretend and even imagine themselves to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to the question. For some of the children, indeed all who have been missed at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wounds see such as might be made by a rat or small dog, and although not of much importance individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a system or method of its own. The police of the division have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be about. The Westminster Gazette, 25 September, Extra Special. The Hampstead Horror. Another child injured by the Bluefer Lady. We have just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning under a furze bush at the Shooter's Hill side of the Hampstead Heath, which is perhaps less frequented than the other parts. It has the same tiny wound in the throat as had been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. It too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the bluefer lady. Scary little bit. All right, where are we at? We're already into the second hour. I thank those of you that have come along to um, listen to me for um, joining me. I am going to next read a short story, another short story by Robert E. Howard um, called The Right Hand of Doom. This is a story of Solomon Cain, the Puritan swashbuckler who roams the earth of the 16th century, smiting the wicked and evil where he find it, be it supernatural or all too human. This, then, is Robert E. Howard's The Right Hand of Doom. And he hangs at dawn, ho-ho! The speaker smote his thigh resoundingly and laughed in a high-pitched grating voice. He glanced boastfully at his hearers and gulped the wine which stood at his elbow. The fire leaped and flickered in the taproom fireplace, and no one answered him. 
Roger Simeon, the necromancer, sneered the grating voice. A dealer in the diabolic arts and a worker of black magic. My word, all his foul power could not save him when the king's soldiers surrounded his cave and took him prisoner. He fled when the people began to fling cobblestones at his windows and thought to hide himself and escape to France. Ho, ho, his escape shall be at the end of a noose. A good day's work, say I. He tossed a small bag on the table where it clinked musically. The price of a magician's life, he boasted. What say you, my sour friend? This last was addressed to a tall, silent man who sat near the fire. This man, gaunt, powerful and somberly dressed, turned his darkly pallid face towards the speaker and fixed him with a pair of deep, icy eyes. I say, he said in a low, powerful voice, that you have this day done a damnable deed. You, yon necromancer was worthy of death, belike, but he trusted you, naming you his one friend, and you betrayed him for a few filthy coins. Methinks you will meet him in hell some day. The first speaker, a short, stocky, and evil-faced fellow, opened his mouth as if for an angry retort, and then hesitated. The icy eyes held his for an instant. Then the tall man rose with a smooth, cat-like motion and strode from the taproom in long, springy strides. "'Who is yon?' asked the boaster resentfully. "'Who is he to uphold magicians against honest men? By God, he is lucky to cross words with John Redley and keep his heart in his bosom.' The tavern keeper leaned forward to secure an ember for his log stem pipe and answered dryly, And you be lucky too, John, for keeping that mouth shut. That be Solomon Cain, the Puritan, a man dangerouser than a wolf. Redley grumbled beneath his breath and muttered an oath, and sullenly replaced the money bag in his belt. Are you staying here tonight? I, Redley answered sullenly. I rather I'd stay to watch Simeon hang in Torquetown tomorrow, but I'm London bound at dawn. Tavern keeper filled their goblets. Goblets. Here's to Simeon's soul. May God have mercy on the wretch, and may he fail in the vengeance he swore to take on you. John Redley swore, then laughed with reckless bravado. The laughter rose emptily and broke on a false note. Solomon Cain awoke suddenly and sat up in bed. He was a light sleeper, as becomes a man who habitually carries his life in his hand, and somewhere in the house had sounded a noise which had roused him. He listened. Outside, as he could see through the shutters, the world was whitening with the first tints of dawn. Suddenly the sound came again, faintly. It was as if a cat were clawing its way up the wall. Outside, Cain listened, and then came a sound as if someone were fumbling at the shutters. The Puritan rose and sword in hand crossed the room suddenly and flung them open. The world lay sleeping to his gaze. A late moon hovered over the western horizon. No marauder lurked outside his window. He leaned out, gazing at the window to the chamber next his. The shutters were open. Cain closed his shutters and crossed to his door went out into the corridor. He was acting on impulse as he usually did. These were wild times. This tavern was some miles from the nearest town, Torka Town. Bandits were common. Someone or something had entered the chamber next his, and its sleeping occupant might be in danger. Cain did not halt to weigh pros and cons, but went straight to the chamber door and opened it. The window was wide and the light streaming in illumined the room yet made it seem to swim in a ghostly mist. A short, yeah. evil-visaged man snored on the bed, and he, Cain, recognized as John Redley, the man who had betrayed the necromancer to the soldiers. Then his gaze was drawn to the window. On the sill squatted what looked like a huge spider, and as Cain watched, it dropped to the floor and began to crawl towards the bed. The thing was broad and hairy and dark, and Cain had noted that it had left a stain on the window sill. It moved on five thick and curiously jointed legs, and altogether had such an eerie appearance about it that Cain was spellbound for the moment. Now it had reached Redley's bed and clambered up the bedstead in a strange, clumsy sort of matter. 
Now it poised directly over the sleeping man, clinging to the bedstead, and Cain started forward with a shout of warning. That instant, Redley awoke and looked up. His eyes flared wide. A terrible scream broke from his lips, and simultaneously the spider thing dropped, landing full on his neck. And even as Cain reached the bed, he saw the legs lock and heard the splintering of John Redley's neck bones. The man stiffened and lay still, his head lolling grotesquely on his broken neck, and the thing dropped from him and lay limply on the bed. Cain bent over the grim spectacle, scarcely believing his eyes, for the thing which had opened the shutters, crawled across the floor and murdered John Redley in his bed, was a human hand. Now it lay flaccid and lifeless, and Cain gingerly thrust his rapier point through it and lifted it up to his eyes. The hand was that of a large man, apparently, for it was broad and thick, with heavy fingers and almost covered by a matted growth of ape-like hair. It had been severed at the wrist and was caked with blood. A thin silver ring was on the second finger, a curious ornament made in the form of a coiling serpent. Cain stood gazing at the hideous relic as the tavern keeper entered, clad in his nightshirt, candle in one hand and blunderbuss in the other. What's this? he roared as his eyes fell upon the corpse on the bed. Then he saw what Cain held spitted on his sword and his face went white. As if drawn by an irresistible urge, he came closer, his eyes bulged. Then he reeled back and sank into a chair. So pale, Cain thought he was going to swoon. God's name, sir, let that thing not live. There be a fire in the tap room, sir. Cain came into Torkertown before the morning had waned. At the outskirts of the village, he met a garrulous youth who hailed him. Sir, like all honest men, you will be pleasured to know that Roger Simeon the Black Magician was hanged this dawn just as sunup came, sir. And was his passing manly? asked Cain somberly. Aye, sir, he flinched not, but a weird deed it was. Look ye, sir, Roger Simeon went to the gallows with, what, with but one hand to his arms. And how came that about? Last night, sir, as he sat in his cell like a great black spider, he called one of his gods, and asking for a last favor, bade the soldier to strike off his right hand. The man would not do it at first, but he feared Roger's curse, and at last he took his sword and smote off the hand at the wrist. Then Simeon, taking it in his left hand, flung it far through the bars of his cell window, uttering many strange and foul words of magic. The gods were sore afraid, but Roger offered not to harm them, saying he hated only John Redley that betrayed him. And he bound the stump of his arm to stop the blood, and all the rest of the night he sat as a man in a trance and at times mumbled to himself, as a man that unknowingly talks to himself, and to the right he would whisper, and bear to the left, and on, on. Oh, sir, twas grisly to hear him, they say, and to see him crouching over the bloody stump of his arm. And as dawn was grey, they came and took him forth to the gallows, and as they placed the noose about his neck, suddenly he writhed and strained as with effort, and the muscles in his right arm, which lacked the hand, bulged and creaked as though we were breaking some mortal's neck. Then, as the guards sprang to seize him, he ceased and began to laugh. And terrible and hideous his laughter bellowed out, until the noose broke it short, and he hung black and silent in the red eye of the rising sun. Solomon Cain was silent, for he was thinking of the fearful terror which had twisted John Redley's features in the last swift moment of waking and life, ere doom struck. And a dim picture rose in his mind, that of a hairy severed hand crawling on its fingers like a great spider, blindly through the dark nighttime forest to scale a wall and fumble open a pair of bedroom shutters. Here his vision stopped, recoiling from the continuance of that dark bloody drama. What terrible fires of hate had blazed in the soul of the doomed necromancer, and what hideous powers had been his to so send that bloody hand groping on its mission, guided by the magic and will of that burning brain. Yet to make sure, Solomon asked, And was the hand ever found? Nay, sir. Men found the place where it had fallen when it was thrown from the cell, but it was gone, and a trail of red led into the forest. Doubtless a wolf devoured it. Doubtless, answered Solomon Cain, and were Simeon's hands great and hairy with a ring on the second finger of the right hand. Aye, sir, 
a silver ring coiled unto the like of a snake. Creepy little story. Um, but, um, well of um, Robert E. Howard's type of horror and action. Um, let's see, 725. Um, let's see what else I can get you into. What I have scheduled. I was going to read some HP Lovecraft, but I do not have that prepared. Um, instead, let's go to the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Volume 2. And I've got a couple of stories here to tell. This next one, as we go back to Edgar Allan Poe, um, is not a long one, but um, is one of my favorite, and I think it might be one of your favorite as well. Kitty cat, you just had to go messing, didn't you? You did. Get. Get thee gone. You're not welcome in this corner. Messing with my lights. Now, I present to you Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of acute hearing. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthfully, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man during the whole week before I killed him, and every night about midnight I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh so gently, and then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern all closed, closed that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously. Excuse me. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked, I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye, and this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, and inquiring how he passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. 
Upon the eighth night, I was more than unusually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. Ha! I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with thick darkness, for the shutters were closed, fastened, through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was a groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no! It was a low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world swept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim, and it was the mournful influence of that unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lying down, I resolved to open a little, a very little crevice in the lantern, so I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at last a simple dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot from out the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw with perfect distinctness all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon that damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the sense? Now I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates a soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instance. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. <coughs> Tito, I'm glad you could make it. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise that this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leapt into the room. He shrieked once, once only. 
In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eyes would trouble me no more. If you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had cut all. Ha <laughs> ha! When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves, with perfect suavity, as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure and undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things, but ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness, until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton, <gasps> and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I rose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observation of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chattered pleasantly and smiled. Was it possibly they heard not? Almighty God, no, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear these hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart.
Okay. Now, give me a couple of minutes. I'll find one more story to close out our um, little evening. This is what I needed right here. Hmm. Let me look at the... Yes, I think we will close out with hmm lots of choices here. Um, let me find it. It must be in here. It must be. Hmm. Now that one's a bit long. This one by H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> I should do the Old Testament of the Bible. Oh my God. I would absolutely do passages from the Bible. But if you're going to endure that, you would also probably have to endure passages from the Quran as well because I'm going to give evil equal representation to the various faiths if I do that. But for tonight, this will be the final story of the night by H.P. Lovecraft, 1921. This then is the music of Eric Zahn. I have examined maps of the city with greatest care, yet have never again found the Rue d'Auxerre. These maps have not been modern maps alone, for I know that names change. I have, on the contrary, delved deeply into all the antiquities of the place and have personally explored every region of whatever name which could possibly answer to the street I knew as the Rue d'Auxerre. But despite all I have done, it remains a humiliating fact that I cannot find the house, the street, or even the locality where, during the last months of my impoverished life as a student of metaphysics at the university, I heard the music of Eric Zahn. That my memory is broken, I do not wonder. For my health, physical and mental, was gravely disturbed throughout the period of my residence in the Rue de Seine. And I recall that I took none of my few acquaintances there. But that I cannot find the place again is both singular and per perplexing. For it was within a half hour's walk of the university, and was distinguished by peculiarities which could hardly be forgotten by anyone who had been there. I have never met a person who has seen the Rue de Sale. The Rue de Sale lay across a dark river bordered by precipice, precipitous brick, blear-windowed warehouses, and spanned by a ponderous bridge of dark stone. It was always shadowy along that river as if the smoke of neighboring factories shut out the sun perpetually. The river was also odorous with evil stenches which I have never smelled elsewhere, and which may some day help me to find it, since I should recognize them at once. Beyond the bridge were narrow cobbled streets with rails, and then came the ascent, at first gradual, but incredibly sleep, as the Rue de Sale was reached. I have never seen another street as narrow and as steep as the Rue de Sale, it was almost a cliff, closed to all vehicles, consisting in several places of flights of steps, and ending at the top in a lofty ivied wall. Its paving was irregular, and sometimes stone slabs, sometimes cobblestones, and sometimes bare earth with struggling greenish-gray vegetation. The houses were tall, peak-roofed, and incredibly old, and crazily leaning backward, forward, and sidewise. Occasionally, an opposite pair, both leaning forward, almost met across the street like an arch, and certainly they kept most of the light from the ground below. There were a few overhead bridges from house to house across the street. And then the inhabitants of that street impressed me peculiarly. At first I thought it was because they were all silent and reticent, but later decided it was because they were all very old. I do not know how I came to live on such a street, but I was not myself when I moved there. I had been living in many poor places, always evicted for want of money, until at last I came upon that tottering house in the Rue de Sale, kept by the paralytic Blandot. 
It was the third house from the top of the street, and by far the tallest of them all. My room was on the fifth story, the only inhabited room there since the house was almost empty. On the night I arrived, I heard strange music from the peaked garret overhead, and the next day asked old Blandet about it. He told me it was an old German viol player, a strange dumb man who signed his name as Eric Zahn and who played evenings in a cheap theater orchestra, adding that Zahn's desire to play in the night after his return from the theater was the reason he had chosen this lofty and isolated garret room whose single gabled window was the only point on the street from which one could look over the terminating wall at the decli declivity and panorama beyond. God, gotta love those old words. Thereafter I heard Zan every night, and although he kept me awake, I was haunted by the weirdness of his music. Knowing little of the art myself, I was yet certain that none of his harmonies had any relation to music I had heard before and concluded that he was a composer of highly original genius. The longer I listened, the more I was fascinated, until after a week I resolved to make the old man's acquaintance. One night, as he was returning from his work, I intercepted Zahn in the hallway and told him that I would like to know him and be with him when he played. He was a small, lean, bent person, with shabby clothes, blue eyes, grotesque, satyr-like face, and nearly bald head and at my first words seemed both angered and frightened. My obvious friendliness, however, finally melted him, and he grudgingly motioned me to follow him up the dark, creaking, and rickety attic stairs. His room, one of only two in the steeply pitched garret, was on the west side towards the high wall that formed the upper end of the street. Its size was very great, and seemed the greater because of its extraordinary barrenness and neglect. A furniture, there was only a narrow iron bedstead, a dingy washstand, a small table, a large bookcase, and an iron music rack and three old-fashioned chairs. Sheets of music were piled in disorder about the floor. The walls were of bare boards and had probably never known plaster, whilst the abundance of dust and cobwebs made the place seem more deserted than inhabitant. Evidently, Eric Zahn's world of beauty lay in some far cosmos of the imagination. Motioning me to sit down, the dumb man closed the door, turned the large wooden bolt, and lighted a candle to augment the one he had brought with him. He now removed his vial from its moth-eaten bag, and taking it, seated himself in the least, com least uncomfortable of the chairs. He did not employ the music rack, but offering no choice in playing from memory, enchanted me for over an hour with strains I had never heard before, strains which must have been of his own devising. To describe their exact nature is impossible for one unversed in music. They were a kind of fugue with recurrent passages of the most captivating quality, but to me were notable for the absence of any of the weird notes I had overheard from my room below on other occasions. Those haunting notes I had remembered, and had often hummed and whistled inaccurately to myself, so that when the player at length laid down his bow, I asked him if he would render some of them. As I began my request, the wrinkled satyr-like face lost the bored placidity it had possessed during the playing, and seemed to shew the same curious mixture of anger and fright which I had noticed when I first accosted the old man. For a moment I was inclined to use persuasion regarding rather lightly the whims of senility, and even tried to awaken my host's weirder mood by whistling a few of the strange to which I had listened the night before. But I did not pursue this course for more than a moment. For when the dumb musician recognized the whistled air, his face grew suddenly distorted with an expression wholly beyond, beyond analysis, and his long, cold, bony hand reached out to stop my mouth and silence the crude imitation. As he did this, he further demonstrated his eccentricity by casting a startled glance towards the lone curtained window, as if fearful of some intruder. A glance doubly absurd, since the garret stood high and in inaccessible above all the adjacent roofs, this window being the only point on the steep street, as the concierge had told me, from which one could see over the wall at the summit. The old man's glance brought Blandot's remark to mind, and with a certain capriciousness I felt a wish to look out over the wide and dizzying panorama of moonlit roofs and city lights beyond the hilltop which all of the dwellers in Rue de Sale only this crab musician could see. 
I moved towards the window and would have drawn aside the nondescript curtains, when with a frightened rage even greater than before, the dumb lodger was upon me again, this time motioning with his head towards the door as he nervously strove to drag me thither with both hands. Man. Now, thoroughly disgusted with my host, I ordered him to release me and told him I would go at once. His clutch relaxed, and as he saw my disgust and offense, his own anger seemed to subside. He tightened his relaxing grip, this time in a friendly manner, forcing me into a chair. Then, with an appearance of wistfulness crossing to the littered table, where he wrote many words with a pencil in the labored French of a foreigner. The note which he finally handed me was an appeal for tolerance and forgiveness. Zahn said that he was old and lonely, and afflicted with strange fears, and nervous disorders connected with his music, and with other things. He had enjoyed my listening to his music, and wished I would come again and not mind his eccentricities. But he could not play to another his weird harmonies, and could not bear hearing them from another, nor could he bear having anything in his room touched by another. He had not known until our hallway conversation that I could overhear his playing in my room, and now asked me if I would arrange with Blandot to take a lower room where I could not hear him in the night. He would, he wrote, defray the difference in rent. As I sat deciphering the execrable French, I felt more lenient towards the old man. He was a victim of physical and nervous suffering, as was I, and my metaphysical studies had taught me kindness. In the silence, there came a slight sound from the window. The shutter must have rattled in the night wind, and for some reason I started almost as violently as did Eric Zahn. So when I had finished reading, I shook my host by the hand and departed as a friend. The next day, Blandet gave me a more expensive room on the third floor, between the apartments of an aged moneylender and the room of an ex respectable upholsterer. There was no one on the fourth floor. It was long, not long before I found that Zahn's eagerness for my company was not as great as it had seemed while he was persuading me to move down from the fifth story. I, he did not ask me to call on him, and when I did call he appeared uneasy and played listlessly. This was always at night. In the day he slept and would admit no one. My liking for him did not grow, though the attic room and the weird music seemed to hold an odd fascination for me. I had a curious desire to look out of that window, over the wall and down the unseen slope at the glittering roof and spires which must lie outspread there. Once I went up to the great garret during theater hours, when Zahn was away but the door was locked. What I did succeed in doing was to overhear the nocturnal playing of the dumb old man. At first I would tip up toe up to my old fifth floor, then I grew bold enough to climb the last creaking staircase to the peaked garret. There in the narrow hall outside the bolted door with covered he keyhole, I often heard sounds which filled me with an in indefinable dread, the dread of vague wonder and brooding mystery. It was not that the sounds were hideous, for they were not, but that they held vibrations suggesting nothing on this globe of earth and that at certain intervals they assumed a symphonic quality which I could hardly conceive as produced by one player. Certainly, Eric Zahn was a genius of wild power. As the weeks passed, the playing grew wilder, whilst the old musician acquired an increasing haggardness and furtiveness pitiful to behold. He now refused to admit me at any time, and shunned me whenever we met on the stairs. Then, one night, as I listened at the door, I heard the shrieking vial swell into a chaotic, a chaotic babble of sound, a pandemonium which would have led me to doubt my own shaking sanity, had there not come from behind that barred portal a piteous proof that the horror was real, the awful, inarticulate cry which only in mute can utter, and which rises only in moments of the most terrible fear or anguish. I knocked repeatedly at the door, but received no response. Afterward, I waited in the black hallway, shivering with cold and fill, fear, till I heard the poor musician's feeble effort to rise from the floor by the aid of a chair. Believing, believing him just unconscious after a fainting fit, I renewed my rapping, and at the same time calling out my name reassuringly. I heard Zahn stumble to the window and close both shutter and sash, then stumble to the door which he falteringly unfastened to admit me. This time his delight at having me present was real 
for his distorted face gleamed with relief while he clutched at my coat as a child clutches its mother's skirts. Shaking pathetically, the old man forced me into a chair while he sank into another, beside which his viol and bow lay carelessly on the floor. He sat for some time inactive, nodding oddly, but having a paradoxical suggestion of intense and frightened listening. Subsequently, he seemed to be satisfied, and crossing to a chair by the table, wrote a brief note, handed it to me and returned to the table, where he began to write rapidly and incessantly. The note implored me in the name of mercy and for the sake of my own curiosity to wait where I was while he prepared a full account in German of all the marvels and terrors which beset him. I waited, and the dumb man's pencil flew. It was perhaps an hour later, while I still waited, and while the old musician's feverishly written sheet still continued to pile up, that I saw Zahn start as if from the hint of a horrible shock. Unmistakably, he was looking at the curtain window and listening shudderingly. Then I half fancied I heard a sound myself, though it was not a horrible sound, but rather an exquisitely low and infinitely distant musical note, suggesting a player in one of the neighboring houses or in some abode beyond the lofty wall over which I had never been able to look. Upon Zan the effect was terrible, for dropping his pencil suddenly he rose, seized his viol, and commenced to rend the night with the wildest playing I had ever heard from his bow, save when listening at the barred door. It would be useless to describe the playing of Eric Zahn on that dreadful night. It was more horrible than anything I had ever overheard, because I could now see the expression of his face, and could realize that this time the motive was stark fear. He was trying to make a noise, to ward off something or drown something out. What I could not imagine, awesome though I felt it must be. The playing grew fantastic, delirious and hysterical, yet kept to the last the qualities of supreme genius which I knew this strange old man possessed. I recognized the air. It was a wild Hungarian dance popular in the theaters, and I reflected for a moment that this was the first time I had ever heard Zahn play the work of another composer. Louder and louder, wilder and wilder mounted the shrieking and whining of the desperate viol. The player was dripping with an uncanny perspiration and twisted like a monkey, always looking frantically at the curtain window. In his frenzied strains I could almost see shadowy satyrs and bacchanals dancing and whirling insanely through seething abysses of cloud and smoke and lightning. And then I thought I heard a shriller, steadier note that was not from the vial, a calm, deliberate, purposeful, mocking note from far away in the west. At this juncture the hut shutter began to rattle in a howling night wind which had sprung up outside, as if in answer to the mad playing within. Zan's screaming viol now outdid itself, emitting sounds I had never thought a viol could emit. The shutter rattled more loudly, unfastened, and commenced slamming against the window. Then the glass broke shiveringly under the persistent impact, and the chill wind rushed in, making the candles sputter, and rustling the sheets of paper on the table where Zan had begun to write out his horrible secret. I looked at Zan and saw that he was past conscious observation. His blue eyes were bulging, glassy and sightless, and the frantic playing had become a blind, mechanical, unrecognizable orgy that no pen could even suggest. A sudden gust, stronger than the others, caught up the manuscript and bore it towards the window. I followed the flying sheets in desperation, but they were gone before I reached the demolished panes. Then I remembered my old wish to gain gaze from this window, the only window in the Rue de Sale from which one might see the slopes beyond the wall, and the city outspread beneath. It was very dark, but the city's lights always burned, and I expected to see them there amidst the rain and wind. Yet when I looked from the highest of all gable windows, looked while the candles sputtered, and the insane vial howled with the wind might, I saw no city spread below, and no friendly lights gleaming from remembered streets but only the blackness of space, illimitable, unimagined space alive with motion and music, and having no semblance to anything on earth. And as I stood there looking in terror, the wind blew out both candles in that ancient peaked garret, leaving me in savage and impenetrable darkness with chaos and pandemonium before me, and the daemon madness of the night-baying vial behind me. I staggered back in the dark, 
without the means of striking a light, crashing against a table, overturning a chair, and finally groping my way to the place where the blackness screamed with shocking music. To save myself and Eric Zahn, I could at least try, whatever powers opposed to me. Once I thought some chill thing brushed me, and I screamed, but my scream could not be heard above that hideous vial. Suddenly, out of the blackness of the madly sawing bow, struck me, and I knew I was close to the player. I felt ahead and touched the back of Zahn's chair, and then found, and shook his shoulder in an effort to bring him to his senses. He did not respond, and still the vial shrieked on without slackening. I moved my hand to his head, whose mechanical nodding I was able to stop, and shouted in his ear that we must both flee from the unknown things of the night. But he neither answered me nor abated the frenzy of his unutterable music, while all through the garret strange currents of wind seemed to dance in the darkness and babble. When my hand touched his ear I shuddered, though I knew not why, knew not why till I felt of the still face, the ice-cold, stiffened, unbreathing face, whose glassy eyes bulged uselessly into the void, and then, by some miracle finding the door and the large wooden bolt, I plunged wildly away from that glassy-eyed thing in the dark, and from the ghoulish howling of that accursed vial, whose fury increased even as I plunged. Leaping, floating, flying down those endless stairs through the dark house, racing mindlessly out into the narrow, steep, and ancient streets of steps and tottering houses, clattering down the steps and over cobblestones, to the lower streets and the putrid canyon walled river, panting across the great dark bridge to the broader, healthier streets and boulevards we know. All these are terrible impressions that linger with me, and I recall that there is no wind, and that the moon was out, and that all the lights of the city twinkled. Despite my most careful searches and investigations, I have never been since able to find the Rue de Seo, but I am not wholly sorry either for this or for the loss in undreamable abysses of the closely written sheets which alone could have explained the music of Eric Zahn. All right. I think that is all I have for tonight before I go hoarse. I thank those of you that decided to stop by and um, help me indulge in my little bit of craziness. I see I haven't driven you all off, so let me see who is still streaming and um, maybe bounce you over there. Let's give it to Dune Sea Punk. Follow me along on the raid. Oh, wrong keyboard. And see if we can get at least a few raiders. Oh, somebody dropped. Three raiders. Can we get three? Can we get four? Nope. Two, three, two, three. Undecided. Anyhow, as we wind down, I have been Jingo the Fool. Um, this has been um, waxing poetic and prosaic. Um, perhaps I will do this again sometime. Um, meanwhile, here we go.
I ran out of time. <laughs> you were reading poetry? That actually sounds kind of Was it poetry that you wrote? Or like book, like written poetry? You got uh, I had it written for your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Tito Q85. I got you, dude. Well, thank you for coming in, you guys. I really appreciate it. In the and mint gelato sounds amazing. I'm doing that whole diet thing now, so I don't. Unless, like, I make oh, no. my own. Okay. No Q, 85. You know who that sounds like? Joshua T, 85. <laughs> oh yeah, he has uh, the T as well, doesn't he? 85. Oh, I, okay, we continue. I'm going to do a shout out as well. Uh, I, uh, not G. There we go. <laughs> I can't type. Oh gosh, it's my turn. Ah. <laughs> what did I do? 